Today I want you to turn with me to the book of John chapter 11. And we're going to highlight a story that is so popular, they've written songs about it. Mel has sung a song about it. And um, it's about a man by the name of Lazarus. How many of you know that story? I'm going to read the story of Lazarus, and I'm going to bring this message over as best as the Holy Spirit would allow me to this morning. And I want you to follow along, and I want you to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that the devil can come in and snatch the words of God from us if we don't soften our hearts, if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to, allow, to, to soften us up, to plow that ground, so that when the word comes... It will fall in good soil. <laughs> John chapter 11. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby there are things that you will go through in your life and it's not unto death although it resembles death I'm not talking about a physical death I'm talking about although it was meant and it is destroying all it is bringing depression it is bringing anxiety it is opening the door for all these things to happen in your life for you to become more fearful, for you to become, you know, less trusting in God and, and want to throw in the towel. These things will happen, but God is saying and he's reminding you, this is only happening so that my power can be realized. You look at it and you say, why God is allowing it? God is saying so that my name can be glorified. Yeah. All you got to do is keep praying, Anthony. Keep praying. When Jesus, and in verse 5 he says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. I want you to pay attention to that. Jesus deliberately stayed an extra two days. This is the man he loves. This was Lazarus' best friend kind of thing. And Jesus deliberately stayed two extra days while you were dying. While your family was breaking apart. While your job was in shambles. While that addiction was taking you apart, he waited two extra days. That loved one that you didn't see coming to Christ, Jesus waited two extra days. And you're there and you're mad at him. I could imagine Mary when she said those words. She said, Lazarus, the one you love us. In other words, she was saying, you claim that you loved him and you couldn't make time to come. Some of you right now, you're praying, you claim that you love me and I'm not seeing you in my situation. It seems like the devil has more say over my life than God does. Right now, some of you are praying that and you're saying that to God. You're, just, you're, you're upset. And God is saying, I'm waiting. I'm deliberately waiting two more days. Not for anything, but so that the kingdom of God can be glorified in your life. Your timing is not God's timing. And God's timing is not your timing. Wow, when he heard Lazarus was sick, he stayed. Boy, who knows, maybe he was on his way. And when he heard he was sick, he said, all right, turn him back. That's the opposite of what you would expect God to do. 
Two more days he waited. His disciples says unto him, no. Then after that saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judah, Judea again. His disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. Notice, your situation may have the resemblance of death. But God look at death and calls it asleep. God will change the name of your situation that represents death because he knows all he got to do is says, Lazarus, wake up and he will live again. Or he will wake up from the sleep. Let me ask you something. When some of you go to the morning time to your children's room, you're going with expectation that when you knock on that door, there will be a voice at the other end or somebody groaning and says one more hour or two more hours or something like that or not yet. You are expecting life to come forth from that room. When Jesus went to pray or say he was going to pray for Lazarus, Lazarus was still sleeping. He was looking at Lazarus and he looked at death because death don't have no hold on him. So just like sleep have no hold on you, when you walk into that room of your child and you're saying wake up, you don't look at it as death because you know that they're going to wake up again. The same thing when Jesus looked at death, he's looking at it as sleep and he's saying they're going to wake up. He don't operate like we operate. We look at sleep and says, hey, wake up. And they're like, oh, no, I don't want to wake up right now. Come brush your teeth. You got school. No, I don't want to do it. You mothers know what I'm talking about. Jesus, just like you, imagine what, is, what goes through your mind when you walk to your child's room to wake him up. Do you walk there thinking they're dead? What goes into your mind? You're just going to do something that you've done every morning since the day they were born. To wake him up. Jesus walked to the grave doing something that he came into this world to do. To wake us up. He walked to that grave and he says, I have the power over death, hell, and the grave. Whoever sleeps in me is just sleeping. They're not truly dead. So he has the power to wake them up. So when he said that Lazarus was just sleeping, he knows exactly what he's talking about. And I believe he was looking at it as the same way you mothers will look at waking up your child in the morning. He was sleeping. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now what was he saying? In the natural those things that are happening, I don't want to take away from it. It is, what is it. it is what it is. But when I look at death, they are just sleeping. When I look at a blind eyes, they just shut their, their eyes for a moment. When I look at a lame man, they're just sitting for a moment. When I look at a leper, it's just for a moment. Because I'm going to show up. And the kingdom of God will take glory. And I am glad for your sake that I was not there. Can you believe Jesus right now? The dude was dead. And he said, I'm glad for your sake that I wasn't there. To the intent ye may believe. Come on, church. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, 
which is called the Dimas or Didamas, unto his fellow disciples. Let us also go that we may die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Your situation look hopeless. But what you didn't understand is that God was deliberately delaying his answer. Your answer was on its way, but it wasn't to happen instantaneously. The Bible says Daniel, when he prayed for God to do something, he fasted and prayed 21 days. That's where you see the 21-day the fast that a lot of churches are doing and so on and so forth. He fasted 21 days before he heard from heaven an answer from God. Yes, in his case, Adrian... Angel Gabriel was battling the prince of Persia. And God had to release Michael to come and fight the prince of Persia so that Gabriel could come and bring the message. But in this case, God is saying, I am not sending your message. I am delaying your message because I want God to get the glory in and through your life. What they say? A delayed answer is not an unanswered prayer. Sometimes as human beings, man, we want it right there and then. We want it right there and then. And we say, okay, God is not answering. And God is saying, hey, I am coming in two days. By the way, some of you know that a day with man is a thousand uh, a, a year with man is a thousand years with God. So a day with man might be a thousand. You guys get the picture? In other words, your timing is not God's timing. And God said, I'm going to show up when you least expect it. Let me give you some breakdown of what happens to a body when it's been dead for four days. There is no more hope. You see, when you died right there and then, yes, you have stuff like rigor mortis will step in, your blood will clot up, you will become stiff, and so on and so forth. If somebody come and raise that person from the dead, there is always the likelihood of people doubting. Why? Because they just died. They could have said they made a mistake. They weren't really dead. They were asleep. So Jesus, what he did to take doubt out of the picture or to take man from getting credit of what, ha what is about to happen, he waited four days before he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. In four days, he started to maybe rot, maybe swell up, whatever the case may be. How many of you have seen a dead carcass? I'm not trying to... to, to tell you I know everything about a dead body, but the truth is, it wasn't natural. Everything, the bodily fluids, everything start to go crazy. I'm telling you, it was beyond the point of no return. When people look at Lazarus, they're looking at him and saying there was some, you know, it was okay to be raised for this. No, it's not. The man was beyond repair. His body was beyond repair. But here comes the light of the world. The king of kings and the lord of lords. The one who look at death, look at death and say they are sleeping. And he commanded him. He said, Lazarus, come forth. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Your situation may be hopeless. And according to the world, you are down for the count. In fact, you have lost. And God says, that is what I'm waiting for. Because now I could get credit over your life. I could get credit in your children's life. I could get credit in your marriage. I could get credit in your home. Because when you get the credit, I don't get the glory. And I will share my glory with none of you. So God waited four days. And in a situation, you need to understand, it wasn't just a raising of the dead. Like he did with Jairus' daughter, it was nothing to do with that. This man was dead for four days. He wasn't on ice. 
How many of you know that? He was in a tomb laying there to rot, to decay for four days. Your family has given up on you. Your loved ones look at you and they see hopelessness instead of hopefulness. As a matter of fact, you've given up on yourself too. You look at it and say, I'll never be free from addiction. I will never be free. My family, you know, everybody, you know, they, they put me out for the count. Well, hey, the count is over and I'm still down. I'm not getting back up. But there is one who hasn't counted you out yet. Lazarus counted himself out. He was dead for four days. He couldn't control it. But God didn't count him out. God didn't count him out. There are some who are rooting for your failures. There are some who want to see you stumble and hit your head on the pavement. There are some who is just right around you waiting for you to fail so they can laugh. Once you don't accomplish more than they have accomplished, there are some who's rooting for you to fail. And God is saying, just for the sake of it, I will let them have fun for the moment. But the time will come when I will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. And I'm not just talking when you get to heaven. I'm talking about now. I'm talking when you walk the face of the earth, they will look at you and say, that man walks with the favor of God. That man don't walk with our reality. That man walks with God's reality. And God is saying that your situation that seems hopeless, your situation that seems like nobody could intervene, no doctor, no, 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 no president, nothing. I believe God is saying, hey, when you call upon me, I'm going to come in the time that I alone will get the glory. He said, roll the stone away. What is that thing that is keeping you locked up? He said, roll it away. He said, but God, I've been bound with addiction for too long. He said, roll the stone away. The doubt, the unbelief, roll it away. Lack of faith, roll it away. I don't need you to do this for me. All I need you to do is roll the stone away. He look at that stone and he sees men's perspective. He looked at that stone. Notice he didn't ask. He didn't himself go and roll the stone away. And what did he do? He called the men and he says, roll the stone away. You put it there, you take it out. If you want me to bring you back to life, you put it there, then you got to take it out. I would be breaking my own law if I forced myself in there. You got to roll it away. When he did that, when they obeyed, yet while they were rolling the stone away, some of you, you are rolling the stone away. You are coming to church. You are rolling the stone away. You're starting to accept Jesus and change your life little by little. You're trying to make things right, and then there are people, your friends, and your families are laughing. There were crowds of people watching and making a mock of him while he's telling them they're like, he's been dead four days now. He's been dead four days now, and they look at you, and they're mocking at you because you are starting to roll the stone away because God said for you to roll the stone away. And in that moment... Because you obeyed God in a hopeless situation. God wanted to see obedience is better than sacrifice. As they rose, see God could have raised Lazarus, but unless man removed the stone, he couldn't have come out of the grave. He could have raised him right in that tomb and he would have been dead still. And you say, God, why are you not doing it? God is saying, you got to roll the stone. You got to forgive. You got to love. 
You got to roll that stone away because if you don't do it, I can't heal your marriage. You got to be the ambassador that will let me in there because you put that stone there. You or your husband are going to have to remove that stone. Oh, come on now. And he says, as you remove the stone of unforgiveness and remove the stone of pride and remove the stone of hatred and jealousy and you remove it. He said, I'm going to come and perform a miracle of restoration, of healing and deliverance that has been there locked up for four days. I'm going to restore it. Skin is going to come back to the bones and layer is going to return to the lungs. And what was once dead is going to live once again because I am the resurrection and the life. No man lays dead when I say for them to live again. Roll the stone away. And while they, when he said that, I could believe the crowd was just looking. and Some may be laughing and some who knew about his ministry looking with great expectation. And before you know it, there is a man wrapped in mommy's cloth. Mummy cloth. I said mommy's cloth. <laughs> Not mommy's cloth. Mummy cloth, right? He was wrapped in it. And then he tell them, untie him. Unwrap him. See, there's a process there. First the stone, the resurrection, but they didn't stop there. Take out everything that represents death. Some of those friends, he said, now you're in a new life. Take out the things that represent death. The places that you used to go, notice he called him out of the tomb. He says, get them out of the place that represents death. And Lazarus. The friend that was once dead is now alive and well. Can you stand to your feet with me? When we learn to trust in Jesus, when we learn to serve him, true it all, true it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. True it all. True it all. I've learned to depend upon His Word. True it all. True it all. I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. True it all. True it all. I've learned to depend upon His Word. Father, we call upon You. And we ask of You to raise the dead. To heal the sick. To open the blind eyes. Yes. Deliver us from evil. Prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Find favor with us and declare us among men. Lord, I'm asking of you prophetically, oh God, do something in this place. We don't want to have church as usual. Lord, we ask of you to let your kingdom come on earth. Fill us and let the light of God be our portion. Help us and let us reflect you in every area of our lives. Yes, we're going through difficulties and trials and testings, but help us, oh God, that through it all we will learn to trust in Jesus.
We love you, Lord. We love you. We surrender to you. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I pray for the families that are here. Lord, you will bless them. You will heal them. You will unite them together. Protect them that the enemy will not come in and destroy what you have put together. Bless them all. And they're going out and they're coming in. Seal them under your precious blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You could have your seats at this time.